Hello, sons and daughters of mine. I know that you'll be watching this video. I know that one day you're going to be scrolling back uh, to my old stuff and watching me become the man that you now know. And in this video, I'm making a document. I'm sharing something publicly for everybody to see because I've got a lot of people who watch me. Um, and also for you uh, because I am growing. You know, your wife and I have been through a lot of challenges this year your wife, your mom and I, my wife, we've been through a lot of challenges and I've been hit with a lot of setbacks, uh, but I'm fighting for you guys. And this year I've learned a lot about myself and I've had to really let go of certain things that have been preventing me from being the man that I know that I need to be in order to be the vision that I have for you guys. Um, and for the viewers otherwise, this video is going to be Lessons I've Learned at 23, and I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 lessons, 9 things that I've gathered from this year. This has been my first year married. It's been my first year where I have attempted a higher scale in my business beyond just my brand, beyond my name and face, because I desire for my content. I want my content to come from a place of giving. I want to give you guys things that can genuinely transform your life. I want to give you guys the tools, uh, both practical as well as mental, uh, to become better men and women. Uh, because I believe that in order to get the things that you want to get out of life, you have to become the sort of a person that can get them easily. Otherwise, it will come and go. And so, truthfully, the journey of business is a journey of self-mastery. And so, in this video... I'm talking about nine areas of my life that I have either come into mastery of and, and, and grown through, uh, or I have been reminded of the necessity to master, or uh, key things that I might have failed in or succeeded in, and all distilled into usable, applicable lessons for yourself, all spoken from the perspective of a now 24-year-old uh, multiple million dollar a year internet-based entrepreneur guy. Uh, who is a good old Indiana boy, God-fearing Christian dude, uh, who just wants to leave a mark and give people what I've been so blessed to have, which is a rightened perspective of the world that has enabled me to be able to create and architect the things that is that I desire with my life, uh, both the money, the relationships, uh, and the health, um, and everything. And I think that this isn't luck. I don't think that there's any in instance of luck here. I think that it is a choice. It starts with a choice in your own heart and head to decide to commit to the process of being who you desire to be. And before you make that decision, everything is folly because any, any ex successes that you have are artificial in nature. It's like taping fruit to a tree. The tree isn't bearing the fruit. It's been taped and it will die. Uh, you need to work on the roots and the trunk and the branches and become the person so that the fruit naturally in its given seasons bears uh, effortlessly just because the sun and the water and the soil are playing their part. It's your job to become the tree. So in this video, I'm talking about nine lessons that I've learned. So I'll start with the very, very first. I wrote down that humility is a superpower. Pride convinces you you deserve something without trying. Pride also creates envy. Only in humility do you become willing to do and become willing to do the work on yourself necessary to have. Becoming comes before having, and pride always blocks the becoming. You know, so uh, this year I had, I, I had, I'm just going to level, I had big ambitions for this year. My first year of marriage, I had certain ideals of what I thought my first year of marriage was going to look like, but I didn't, ha I didn't get them because I stopped doing the things that got me to where I was. So I just, I thought that my success was earned. I thought it was a done deal. I I thought that anybody that didn't see me as the, you know, the <laughs> the savior of the industry that I'm in was uh, an idiot and that I was better than everybody. And, you know, I, I got in my own way in a massive way. And I mean, can you blame me? You know what I mean? Like I was 22, 20, I was like 20 to 22 making way more money than I knew what to do with spending it on things that were ridiculous. I wasn't investing it wisely into the business. Uh, and you know, I mean, I bought just all kinds of ridiculous stuff. Now, here's the thing. I actually have nothing. I actually have one of the lessons in here is about 
how to use material things like cars, watches, houses, and stuff. That's one of the lessons that I've learned this year. But uh, that was a majority of my money. A majority of the money I would make would go into buying stuff. And uh, I wouldn't say that I have regrets because the lesson behind that is so much more valuable than the money. So much more valuable because, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to go on to do quite well for myself financially. And if that's the case, then, yeah, the lesson of when and how to buy nice things is way more uh, uh, valuable than any money that I might have lost on fun crap, (laughs) right? So when I talk about humility being a superpower... When I meet individuals, men and women who have succeeded in business, they all have this undercurrent of um, understanding that they don't deserve anything. And it's that's the reason why they have what they have, actually, is because they don't believe that they deserve anything. You know, humility can often be misconstrued as seeing yourself as uh, like insignificant or small or 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 or, uh, or or self-loathing so self-loathing and humility are very different humility is a right posturing yourself against the truths of the world that will never change uh and business i think is an incredible vehicle for humility to be uh created in somebody Because it shows you that you're not who you thought you were sometimes. It shows you that you thought you had it all together, but you just don't. You know, you thought you had the Midas touch, but you just don't. And things come and go, don't they? And and then it forces you either into one of two things. It forces you to either pretend like it's everybody else's fault or accept that it's your fault. And to pretend like it's everybody else's fault is a guaranteed path in life to living a life of destitution, loneliness, isolation, lack of respect, lack of esteem, lack of accomplishment, lack of influence. And uh, it's a pitiful, depressing hole that you'll find yourself in. Whereas the ladder of humility and accepting that you are not everything that you might think you are right now is actually incredibly freeing. Because all of a sudden, the only choice forward is to do the work. It's the only choice. It's the only choice you have, is to do the work. And how beautiful is that? That's why it's a superpower. Humility is a superpower, because if you believe that you deserve something, you rob yourself of the willingness that comes from that gut knowing that you don't deserve anything. The, the willingness to do the work, the willingness to put in the hours, the willingness to put in the time, the willingness to fail, the willingness to go through the rejection, the willingness to try and try and try and try and then realize that for years you've been trying it the wrong way the whole time. Humility is the only antidote to those pains. There is no other antidote. Don't listen to the people who tell you that you deserve anything. You, as a body, as a thing, don't deserve anything. But your decisions that you make through life, the decisions that you make, can lead you to certain things. And only in a place of humility can you learn the lessons necessary to sustainably create the things that you want out of your life. That's the only posture, is humility. And 20 years old to 22 years old, moving into 23 probably a little bit, I got very prideful. I believed that my success was ordained that I was built for it. And let me caveat this, I do believe that I am because I've found my way back to humility and I've found my way back to accepting that it's grind season again and it's time to get back to work, right? But there for a while, I thought that I'd done it. I was making 150, 200 grand a month, you know, doing quite well. And I thought that I'd just kind of done it, you know what I mean? And it was like a done deal. And uh, it wasn't. It just wasn't. And that's okay. It's a beautiful thing, actually. The lesson there is so much more valuable than anything else. Because imagine... Imagine a a person here for a second for me. Let's visualize an individual, a human being, who has all of these postures of both a willingness to invest time, energy, and money into learning skills that advance them, um, recognizes that they have all the time in the world, 
sees the future as bright inherently and is building towards it and has the humility to accept when he's wrong. Like, who can stop that person? Nothing can stop that person. But it's only when you believe that what you've built is a byproduct of you, not you abiding by the laws of what is required to build and that what you've built is actually a byproduct of those laws being gracious in the fact that they exist and that you've abided by them. Like the laws of compounding or the laws of uh, transaction. What you have for sale or what you do for others always has to be in their eyes of more value than the money they're paying you. Otherwise, you won't make any money. In your relationships, same thing. The quality of your dating relationships, your marriage relationship. Coming from a place of giving, understanding the laws that govern a high-quality interpersonal romantic relationship, or the laws that govern your health, water, sun, uh, exercise, sleep, nutrition. You know, it's, it's not you that's special. It's that these laws are gracious when abided by, and there's humility in that. And I think that that is a beautiful posturing and a life-lasting posturing that can just ooze and seep out of it so much good fruit so that's why it's the first lesson that i've learned and i'm very excited i'm very excited for the future right now because uh wow what a thing i'm working on and how blessed am i to get to work on it um lesson number two success and winning is unrelenting you must stay ahead of the momentum curve. You lose momentum as quickly as you gain it. Learn to stay ahead and only rest when needed. Otherwise, always be planting seeds for future harvest. But enjoy the planting and enjoy the harvest. Now, I don't know if it's been made obvious yet or not, but I'm actually recording this on my birthday. It's the evening of my birthday, November 16th. I just turned 24, so just reflecting. And this lesson is critical. It kind of stems off of the humility lesson. You know, um, it's funny. My backwards year compared to four years ago, like if I were to wrap up this year, what I thought we would wrap up four years ago at, I'd I'd be pretty happy. But it was a backwards year. You know what I mean? And 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 it was because of me. It's my fault. Um, But anyway, success and winning is unrelenting. You must stay ahead of the momentum curve. So what I mean by this is in order to build anything of meaning and of value, uh, particularly a business, you know, uh, most organizations or businesses uh, are byproducts of the law of momentum. So, you know, really when you're running a business, you're basically like the chief momentum officer, right? You're in charge of gaining and keeping momentum. The loss of momentum can come as quickly as the gaining of that momentum. And if you can't come to terms with that, if you have the pride that is blinding you to that reality, then you will lose it. That's why humility is so important. Now, I end this by saying, enjoy the planning and enjoy the harvest. Because, yeah, success is unrelenting. You know, the laws that govern success are unrelenting. But at the same time, you shouldn't just like want the harvest enjoy the process enjoy the journey enjoy the steps between here and there that get you there because what greater gift is there than to learn by doing i also said in here learn to stay ahead and only rest when needed otherwise always planting seeds for future harvest so what i mean by learn to stay ahead you have to develop this instinct of being able to see things coming over the horizon um and be able to prevent them before they get here or solve them uh, pre- like a- as soon as you see them that they've arrived. Uh, but truthfully, the, you know the size of the problem is often much smaller when it's on the horizon. As it gets closer and closer and closer, it gets bigger, 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 harder and harder and harder to solve. You know, one of the things that you have to develop is this back of your head instinct of like, what's coming over the horizon? How am I going to solve it? Yet, enjoy the planning and enjoy the harvest. So just because success is unrelenting, just because it takes a lot of output and and effort and energy, doesn't mean you shouldn't enjoy it. Like, the whole idea that work is not fun. (laughs) Like, that work is this, like, thing that you do so that you can then do what you actually want to do with your life. It's just a ridiculous cultural lie. It's a Western, misconstrued lie. You know, in, uh, 
uh, it wasn't long ago that, that our last names actually used to represent the line of work that we were in, right? And they actually were like a, a calling card for your, uh, for your profession. And whenever I bring this up, I always make the joke that I don't want to know what Cockrum was. So hopefully that, that, hopefully that gets somebody to laugh. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's only been recently in culture that we've, we've disassociated our identity from the service we provide to, to our fellow humans. And we've made money this like evil thing that by earning it, you know, you, you dampen the quality of the service you bring unto people. But this is not true. That would be like saying somebody's gratitude for what you've done for them dampens the service you provided. Like, I should be able to just do things for people, and then they just don't respond or don't say anything about it. It's like, that's ridiculous. Money is a form of transaction, it's, and it's a, a, you know, the word for blood and the word for money in Hebrew uh, is the same word. And the Hebrew language is actually designed with dual meanings into words intentionally. Like in English, the word right and right are two different words. Correct and, like, direction, turning right. But in Hebrew, that's baked into the language, blood and money are the same thing. And blood brings life to things, oxygen to things. It, 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 you know, you breathe in, get some oxygen, the blood goes to your lungs, gets the oxygen it needs, goes back out into your body and, uh, and, and oxygenates the different parts of your body so that it can live. <laughs> So to pretend like blood is a bad and evil thing is the same as pretending like money is a bad and evil thing. It's not. It, it just flows. You know what I mean? It goes where it needs to go. And, and money is not attracted to people who don't stay ahead of momentum. Money's attracted to momentum. All right, so let's move on to the third law. I say law. I said law without even thinking about it. Third lesson following my intuition trusting myself and not worrying if what i'm doing is right or wrong but just putting one foot in front of the other with the ideal in mind at all times this is the only way forward so in recent years i have either mentored or hired individuals into my organization who went on to go and build great things now it's a very awkward and, and touchy conversation when i'm asked about it because it's like how do you deal with that you know what i mean because it's like how do you deal with getting just like absolutely passed up but one of the ways that I dealt with it that I regret having dealt with it that way was in losing trust in myself. Because it was like, if they could take what I was doing and do it better, what about them is better than me? And, and what am I doing wrong? And then I almost like this, like I lost, I, it was like a breach in my own personal trust. So I'd see them go on to do well and I'd be like, hmm, like there's something broken. There's something wrong with me. What am I doing wrong? And then I started searching for what I'm doing wrong. What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And all of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm not actually doing anything wrong. It's just that I'm comparing and I'm envious and I'm not, I'm not riding my own journey. I'm not working on my own timeline anymore. And I lost that a little bit this year. Um, and so the lesson I learned this year was that self-trust cannot be present in an individual who's comparing or envious, it also can't exist in an individual who uh, questions themselves, questions their own uh, inklings or intuitions. And I think there's a certain point of experience that you pass over where you can then truthfully actually trust yourself. But nobody comes into your life and tells you when that is. And nobody's done that for me. And I think it's this year, and especially being married and now having a kid on the way. And truthfully, you know, I'm seeing my father grow older, you know. And it's not that he's, the dude's super athletic, super, like he's like into, like I think he's got another 40 years. <laughs> but like I am seeing, you know, there's pictures of him from 10 years ago and the pictures of him today. And it's like, it's a little, some more gray hairs. You know what I mean? And when you're 14, you know, you don't see this stuff. You're 24, you kind of see this stuff now. And it, it's got me realizing, okay, like, not just him, but anybody that I've listened to and gotten guidance from, they are not permanent. I have to trust myself. I can't just do what I see other people doing or a version of it. I have to trust myself. And that is a crucial conversation, especially for men. 
that I wasn't having with myself. And I'm being very vulnerable because, I don't know, I've, I'm just being vulnerable. And when I say following my intuition, I think intuition is when your head is involved and your heart is involved. Like your head thinks through it logically, but your heart calls the shot as well. And, and my intuition, I, I tend to ignore it because I'm like, is that the right thing to do? Is this the wrong thing to do? And I question myself, right? This binary right or wrong thinking leads me to ignore my own intuition and inklings. And the right and wrong mentality, this, this binary view of the world, came from an over-importance on reaching certain goals that I had. Um, and it also came from envy. Because I would see people doing really well, and I'd be like, what? how am I not there yet? You know what I mean? People that I helped even get started, or people who their first touch of this industry was working in my company, right? And they go on to do incredible things. And you, you last long enough in an industry, you become known, and then it's like, I'm known, but I'm not like, am I like respected? And then this whole thing starts to happen in my head. And so I'm like, how do I do this right? I want to do this right. I want to do this right. I don't want to make any mistakes. I don't want to do it wrong. And my fear of doing things wrong and my deep need to do things right caused me to lose my trust in myself and lose my intuition. So intuition is a powerful force and it can only exist when you're at peace with the things around you. It can only exist when you're just kind of okay with things. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you don't need anything. You don't need to be seen a certain way. You don't need any you don't need any amount of money. You don't need things to succeed. You don't you don't you're not afraid of a failure. You're just in a very uh, just sort of a neutral zone of uh maybe a little bit of peace and joy, you know? And then your intuition can just kind of kick in. And um, and it can, and you can only get intuition when when you don't view decisions in your life through this lens of right or wrong. This even put a dampening on my engagement process with my wife. It's pretty pretty objectively, she's a great wife, but I was so scared. Like, what if I'm making the wrong decision? Is this the right decision? Is this wrong or right? And it's it's actually really interesting. Um, this is kind of a lesson that I'm actually relearning. I think we need reminded as much as we need taught, right? So we need reminded things often. And I've been reminded of some things that I might have like kind of let let go of or forgotten. And actually it has a lot to do too with me having gotten married and then thinking that I need to like reinvent myself in order to be a good husband. It's not true. I don't need to reinvent. I don't need to restart. I almost like went back to square one and like restarted my character. You know what I mean? Um, in reality, I just need to continue to develop and then just give my wife the best parts of me. Maybe that's another lesson. Actually, I did write that down. That is sort of something that I wrote down. But anyway, seeing things as right or wrong dampens your intuition. There is no right or wrong. And it's scary for people because they cling to the security of right and wrong. There's a certain security in this worldview that there is a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. Because if there's a right way to do things, then somebody's ahead of you and has already defined it. Does that make sense? Or if there's if the same with the wrong way. If there's a wrong way to do things, then somebody's already been ahead of you and already defined it, and already defined the rule book, and already defined how it works. And that's not true. That's not how life works. It is, truthfully, just downstream from your own decisions and what you decide to make it. And that's it. So there is no right or wrong. Right or wrong is a, is a uh, man-made concept. No such thing as right or wrong. I'm a devout Christian. And even in singular chapters of singular books in the Bible, there are contradictions. And this is one of the things that um, atheists use to uh, like dismantle the Bible or whatever, which I think is just ridiculous. But I think God knows that there's no, there is no binary right, right or wrong. It's like, it's just love. He just wants you to love him. Just, the world just wants you to love it. There's no right or wrong. It just, it just wants you to show up and love it and, and, and love this thing that you've got called life, this gift that you have to wake up every morning. Right or wrong is an illusion. And it dismantles your intuition. It dismantles your faith, even. Right or wrong is an illusion entirely. And 
the only way forward is just to put one foot in front of the other with the ideal in mind at all times. That's it. Get the ideal in your head of where you kind of uh, are going and then just put one foot in front of the other. You know what I mean? So that's the third lesson. I'll move on to the fourth. The fourth one is showing up as my authentic self is the greatest gift that I can give others. There is not a husband tray in a business tray, just a tray. And I can define that character and act th him through in everything. So what do I mean by this? Well, what I mean is uh, kind of uh, downstream from that belief that there's a right and a wrong comes downstream the, you know, the belief that there is a way to be and a way not to be. That's not true. So when I got married, I, I think I honestly think that when I got married, my mindset just got completely dismantled. Like I came into the year that I was engaged just on fire, like lighting people up. And in the, this first year that I've been married, particularly the first couple months of being married, I was like, all right, what do good husbands do? And I read all these books on like what good husbands do. And I read like I listened to all these like about good husbands and like the right way to be like I found myself back into this binary thinking of good husbandry, <laughs> right? And it's like, it's not true. And I think that that need for things to be right or wrong comes from, uh, honestly, a bit of insecurity that was lying within me that I had had to address in my life. There was this, like, uh, I remember asking some mentors, I'm like, how do you even learn to trust yourself? Like, it's like I don't even feel like I really trust myself. I feel like I'm just doing things that I see people do, and I'm not even... I don't even like, I'm not actually doing anything, it's actually me. And um, it's very fascinating to realize that when you wake up one day and realize that you've just been playing characters that you see other people. And uh, really, actually, a, a huge realization. And then, um, I lost my train of thought. Point, point is, your, your authentic self is the one where you don't need anything right so you're not there you're you're showing up to give and everything and not to get you're showing up to give i watched the lion king the the live animated version one where it's like cgi with my grandma last night and my wife we went over to my grandma's house and uh cool quote from mufasa a king does not ask what he can get he only asks what he can give and I find myself often asking what I can get and how I can get it the fastest and how I can get it the easiest as opposed to asking what I can give and when you are in a state of trying to get and get and get you disrupt your ability to show up authentically and there's a balance to that if you're only giving and you're just sacrificing your own needs constantly. Again, there is no right or wrong, right? There's no left, right, up, down, black, white. Uh, just because you have to give doesn't mean you never get. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you lead with the give, and the get comes. And the get comes strong. And it's come very strong in my life. You just gotta have something for sale that's really good. Basically. That's about it. And then give. Care. Show up for your team, for your clients. So showing up as my authentic self is the greatest gift that I can give others. There's not a husband tray and a business tray, just a tray. And this is something my wife really helped me realize, actually. She was like, I feel like you've just like changed in so many weird ways. She, she pulled me aside and told me that she just didn't recognize like kind of who I'd become. It was a big moment for us. So, yeah, that's the next lesson. Showing up authentically requires... Um, becoming something mm, let me say like this. showing up authentically means not needing anything from the people that you're showing up for yeah having no need you know I think the people who win in business are actually the ones who need it the least and I'm sure you've probably noticed that it's the people who like value it the least and that's because business is a spiritual thing just like life is a spiritual thing the camera just cut but in life the people who need it the least I find tend to get it. I remember being uh, 14 years old, being really, really, really into this girl. 
like cra- like head over heels just like crazy about this girl her name was nia I, I, maybe i don't know who knows maybe you should watch maybe my old friends watch these and i was just like wildly mad like up late at night thinking about her like it was weird <laughs> it was a weird thing and then this uh guy comes along who like met her and like a week later asked her out and she's like yep sure and then they just went out and, and he just didn't care and at the time i didn't realize i was learning a really important lesson of like not placing things on pedestals and i think authenticity only comes when you don't place the rewards of authenticity on a pedestal don't don't place things on a pedestal just show up just show up except that you know you're good enough you're not perfect right again no binaries just because you're good enough doesn't mean you're perfect <laughs> just because you know what i mean like humility you know, it, it's it's actually quite interesting. It's one of the big lessons I've learned is to not think in such ex, uh, um, end extremes because the truths aren't ever found there. The truths are never in the extreme ends of the bell curve. They're always in the middle somewhere. Um, so that's that lesson. The one, two, three, four, five, the fifth lesson that I've learned at 23 uh, stuff is just stuff and isn't that big of a deal. It's a fun trophy worth having the goal to obtain, but it's more of a visual manifestation of a greater ideal. The ideal of becoming worthy of it and who you become in the process. That's the role of material goals, is to act as reminders of who you are, but in and of themselves, they're not worthy ideals. So, you know, I've bought, I've bought some watches that are like people's grail watches, man. $50,000 watches and sported them like nothing warm every day didn't even care like just wore it around you know and uh wore it to the gym even <laughs> just like you know just making so much freaking money and uh yeah uh, it, well what's interesting is you have to go through it. you have to actually experience it and, and actually have these things then realize it's not the thing that you want it's the person associated with the thing isn't it that's why rolex um that's why the uh, dealers for Rolexes and, and Pateks and these watches and even these certain luxury cars like uh, Rolls Royce and stuff, that's why they uh, primarily only sell to individuals of high status is because you, what you're buying is this, a certain version of yourself that you want to become. So what you should really idolize, eh, idolize is a strong word, what, you should, what, what should be your ideal is becoming that person, not the things, not, not the, the strappings, but becoming the person. The reason why you want those things is because you want to become that person. So I think material goals are actually awesome. I think I continue to have material goals. Uh, there's all kinds of things that I want to buy. But it's not because of the things, it's because of the person I need to become in order to have those things and it not be like a massive stretch for my bank account. You know what I mean? I want I want a driveway uh, with a fountain in the middle of it. You know? I don't know if you've heard that before, but like, you know, like one of those like Italian mafia driveways. They'd be sick. Love to have like uh, gardeners tending my uh, yard. I think that'd be sick. Um, and, and you know, these are things that I'm, you know, it's but it's just stuff, right? Like that's the thing is, so the thing itself, the stuff is all it represents is who you've become. The reason why it's super cool when, you know, like as a child, you see like Batman driving a Lambo It'd be a little different if you saw like a total loser who like inherited the Lambo, um, who doesn't even take care of it and is like a total bum driving it. It's like not that cool, right? But it's, you know, it's Bruce Wayne driving the Lambo, right? <laughs> so it, it's who you become that's like the thing. And I think that's the grand story. So these trappings are just little sizzle, spices. They're little, uh, they're just little signatures of being that person and so the stuff is always downstream from becoming the person and so the journey is figuring out who you need to become not what you need to do kind of like the first point that i made about becoming having becoming coming before be having becoming coming before having sorry and so stuff i think you should aim to have stuff i think it's actually really good to aim to have stuff 
because it's very motivating because it's like this visual and it's like you can feel yourself in it and it's it's really it's it's really nice i like that feeling of of desiring things personally i really do um i see nothing wrong with it um because every time that i've achieved a thing that i want like at one point i had twenty thousand dollars a month and a jaguar f-type written on a little sticky note in on my desk and i did that and a rolex jaguar f-type rolex twenty thousand a month did that and the skills I needed to develop in order to have those things were worth having aiming were worth having had aimed at the material things, right? Because now those skills have made me way more money than that, and more importantly than that, they've given me um, a, a, a better perspective on life. Because when you have the right skills, you know, when you have the ability to turn life into something through your skill sets, you have you have a leveled up perspective on life. But in order to be worthy of the things that you want, you have to level up your skill sets. You have to level up who you are. And so I, I think the real gift is that you have a new perspective on life. That's the gift. But stuff in of itself isn't a big deal. So don't idolize the thing. Idolize the journey of becoming worthy of the thing. Right? That's the that's that's the thing that you should really be excited about. Okay. Uh, one, two, three. Six. Lesson six. Nothing lasts like a good reputation, brand, and an image online. The greatest assets that I can develop are my brand online, my skills, my leadership, my team, and my investments. Um, truthfully, anybody can whip together like a decent marketing process and just like build a business on sticks. But what really lasts is your story. It's who you are. Um, so that's the, fir- the, the one of the first forms of modern wealth. I think on a list of artists, like the modern wealth formula would be like your brand, your image, and a loyal following of people who care about you and are championing your success and will buy your stuff. That's a huge asset. Second to that is your leadership skills, your ability to actually lead people and not just be something online, but actually be that thing. So not just look that way, but be that way and be the person that people perceive you as. Uh, downstream from that is you go to lead a team. So leadership still, but leading a team for your organization, learning how to rally people behind a mission and a vision and organize people to uh, build something that uh, has higher leverage than just your own time and effort and energy. Uh, down from that would be uh, uh, my investments. So my brand, my leadership, my team, my investments. These are my greatest assets. And these things always turn into liquid money. Always. They always end up turning into liquid money because they are value in of themselves. Attention is a form of currency. Uh, Leadership is a form of currency. Team is a form of currency. And investments are future currency. So those are the things that I really need to focus my energy into is my brand, my leadership, my team, my investments. That's it. Um, Now, I will continue to run a lot of ads. Like right now, you know, uh, we're spending like $1,500 to $2,000 a day on advertisements. Uh, And I'm going to continue to do that because uh, we should be able to turn like a dollar into four and uh you know we should be able to push like multiple multiple six figure months and uh to be honest like just leveling with you guys i think a big part of why i want to do that is just to be able to like come onto youtube and say that i did it you know what i mean and like be like yo check it out you know and document it and share it and teach it and 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 inspire you guys uh more than anything else um but anyway those are the things that really last and and so it's really tempting and easy to get lost in um like shiny objects and things that don't last. I remember being on a mastermind call with a couple of buddies of mine um, that were like doing really, really well. But it was all direct response marketing. It was all stuff that like it was a dollar in and a certain amount of money out. And not a single one of them was thinking about organic content. Not a single one of them was good on camera, could articulate themselves to a camera, could talk uh, for you know an hour on end like I'm doing right now and articulate their thoughts and, and communicate. Uh, you know, they can't do, they couldn't do that. And when they try to, it's really awkward. And I'm like, because you don't have that skill, I'm going to beat you guys in the long term. And, uh, and that's, that's what happened. <laughs> it's actually kind of nice. Cause it's like, at the time I was really frustrated cause they were passing me up, but now, you know, the whole thing collapsed and it's, it's not, you know, cause they're any less smart. It's not cause they deserve it less or anything. I, it's just because I just did a thing that had longer term leverage. You know what I mean? Like I spent time working on my brand and my image and stuff on the internet. Um, So brand, leadership. So leadership meaning, I really think that a good definition of leadership is 
how quickly and meaningfully, meaningfully meaning how long it lasts that you can get somebody to think and act the way that you think and act. Does that make sense? I think that's leadership. Leadership is influence, really. Um, And so that's a huge skill. The ability to lead people. And leaders create leaders. You know, people have the word, that have worked for my company have gone on to do incredible things. I have very few ex- exceptions to that rule. I'm very proud of that. Same with clients. Clients that end up in our mastermind are our are, are highest tier thing. Not a, I, I literally don't think there's a single one that isn't at seven figures right now. So anyway, uh, team and investments. So team, rallying people, leadership. Again, having great people, picking great people, having very high standards for people and, and not cutting corners there. And then investments. Where do I store my capital? Those are the things that will build me wealth. That, that is the best path that I have to like a really solid eight-figure wealth is that. Um, okay. Now on to the seventh lesson. Everything comes and goes and has seasons to it. But like fruits, every season bears a different kind. To have a favorite fruit is fine, but... To not appreciate the ones that are in season uh, causes you to miss the joys of what that season could be offering you. Enjoy the fruits that come with each season and yet still continue to plant for the future as to do any less is foolish. So, you know, life has seasons to it. There's going to be seasons of of different things coming and going in your life. There's going to be different vicissitudes that you'll sort of find yourself uh, interacting with in your your life. And that's that's the human condition. And to sit back and, and wish that things were a certain way that they were or to look at things as, it, as you wish that they would be robs you of the present, of the now, of the ability to invest in the given moment. Because the, the better future that you desire exists only through how you interact with the given moment. So what's the point of that? And one of the ways to get grateful and be willing to do the work in the given moment is to enjoy the fruits that the given moment offers you. So invest in the given moment by being grateful for the given moment, by enjoying the fruits that the given moment is offering you. Like right now, I'm in my office documenting having just turned 24. This is a great thing to get to do. You know, I've got a really nice camera here. It's like a $4,000 camera. I've got this really nice microphone. And, you know, we had a $6,000 day today, and that was great. And... Um, all these really nice things, you know, I'm, I'm reading a great book that I really, really enjoy. And I had a cigar earlier and my wife is gorgeous and, you know, and all these things. But on the inverse, if I, if I decided to, and if in my heart, I was looking for things to be upset about, I could find them. And you always can. And that, that's such a crazy thing about the human condition is that we, we can always find what we are looking for and we can't move towards things that we don't see we only move towards things that we see so if in your heart you're kind of looking for things to be upset about you're going to find those things you're going to move towards those things your life is going to be something to constantly be upset about but if you're looking for things that are joyful and you're grateful for you're going to move towards those things as well and life comes and goes and has seasons to it there's good things in every season and one of the necessary skills i think of becoming a, a worth a, 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 an adult worthy of the things that you claim that you want and desire because worthiness is so much more important than desire to want something is pointless desire is pointless like want and desire is pointless it's just worthiness it's just doing it um but but to become an adult worthy you have to be an adult in constant recognition of the good things that are around you because what you recognize and give energy to, you you get more of. You get more of that stuff. You know? So every season has fruit. And one of the skills of a worthy adult, adult is the ability to, to sort of filter the world and find the fruit. And see the fruit and enjoy the fruit. Because that's God's gift to you in that moment. God has given you that thing. And, you, and, and it's frustrating... looking at myself in the past when there were fruits in my life that I didn't recognize at the time and I didn't appreciate. And it's just, it's not, frustrating me with the wrong word. I, I, feel, I just, I, I'm sad about it. 
because there were times that I could have been more appreciative of and been more not appreciative but more present in and been able to soak up that fruit a little longer you know um but seasons come and go and the taste of the fruit is always a little different right you know apples are like a fall thing and i think you know uh strawberries are like a i think they're like a spring thing i don't know you get the you get the analogy right different seasons you know like you don't want to go to the grocery store and only eat out of season fruits right that can like you know they've got a bunch of like gmos in them and stuff so it's like fake fruits right so it's not good fruits this season has fruit in it for you right now some kind of a fruit you just find it and enjoy the fruit it's counterintuitive you, you think that by like settling for appreciating the little things robs you of the standard of getting the big stuff but again that's binary thinking you can both enjoy the little things and get the big stuff. And I think, I don't know this, but I think that one of the prerequisites to getting the big stuff is enjoying the little things. Because if you enjoy the little things, that enjoyment, I think, gives you the energy to sustain the sacrifices needed to get the big things. I think. I don't know. Okay. Lesson number eight. Focus on my inner energy more than anything else if I desire power. Direct my energy and channel it to greater things. Use my sexual energy, my sadness or bitterness. Use my joy and gratitude and use these emotions and channel them into greater things. This is the only way to channel my life into something greater. So I'm a pretty feely, I'm a pretty feely guy. I, I feel very strongly. I'm not like a crier necessarily, but I, I have very intense emotion. I'm a very intense individual. And I would imagine that most of the people who watch my content are the same way, because why else would you watch this? But one of the things that I've really learned this year is like, I, I used to have like an anger thing where I would um, feel angry and I would like take it out on something. Like I had a whiteboard once and I just literally punched a hole through the whiteboard. <laughs> And like, I used to have a porn issue, right? So I'd have all, all these sexual energies that I didn't know what to do with, use porn. Or uh, sadness, I, I would go into like deep pits of sadness and just like follow the sadness right to where it takes me. Every single emotion with it has behind it an energy. Just like every car has gas, they all have gas, right? They've all got gasoline in them. They might have different shapes and sizes and sounds, but they've all got gas same way that all your emotions have energy so every single emotion behind it has if you can just tap it just a little bit of power and so every, in this way everything that happens to you every good and bad thing and your response to those good and bad things can be used to create something better and you can find a literal bottomless pit of energy to do whatever you want to do and and not just do whatever you want to do Become whoever you need to become. You know, I think that's sort of my theme going into this year is really becoming. Become, 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 become. Don't just do, but become. And change takes energy. Where do you get that energy from? Or you, you need to source it from yourself. You know what I mean? You need to make sure you're getting sleep and water and drink and ride and all this stuff. But once you're covering those bases, the basics then you need to get energy from your emotions and your instincts. And if you don't, then your instincts and emotions will actually guide you to places that suck more of your energy. So when you experience an emotion, it takes you a place. Or experience an instinct, it takes you a certain place. And if you can't work with it and channel it, then, uh, then you lose a lot of energy that you could be using to develop something incredible. Um, so yeah in order to have more power so basically the, the lesson is to be spending more time focusing on my inner energy uh, to create more power for myself direct my energy and channel it into greater things use my sexual energy my sadness or bitterness use my joy and gratitude these emotions can channel me into greater things all right on to lesson nine. 
people will ultimately do what is in their own best interests, and if my company isn't that for them, to take such news personally is silly, immature, and childish. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's a big one for me because um, I tend to take things personally. And again, like I said, I'm a bit of a feeler. And I want what I do to be seen as amazing by everybody all the time. And if everybody doesn't think I'm awesome all the time, then obviously something's horribly wrong with me and I'm broken and stupid, you know. And that's that's the inner logic that's happening. And I think it's because I grew up in a household that really rewarded performance. At least from me specifically. I don't know that it rewarded performance from every sibling. But from me specifically, I was very rewarded by performance. And if I don't get that reward from other people, and if they don't see me as incredible all the time, then something's obviously wrong, which is just so silly. You know what I mean? And to admit that, I used to I used to hear people who would admit things like that about themselves and see them as weak and think like, oh, you've got something wrong with you. But what I realize now is that everybody's got something wrong with them, and my job is to know what's wrong with me and be able to work with it. Uh, and by working with it, I eventually do heal it and fix it. And so... When people leave, I used to really take it very personally. People leave my company or not have a good experience as a client or stop watching my content or go with another person instead of myself or something like that. It's just so silly. Again, this this almost cycles back to the very first lesson of humility and that I'm just not as important as I think I am. You know what I mean? And when, I'm, and when I humble myself to that reality, it's actually very freeing because it's like, oh, they don't want to work here. There's no benefit in their eyes to working here. Okay, fine. You know, it's not like I ne- I don't need it. And it, it, it all these lessons all all kind of almost like underpinned with a with like a, a current of like humility and letting go of, of need. You know what I mean? Humility and letting go of need. Um, because if you need something to go well, then you stunt to your ability to just do it. You know. Um, you, 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 when you have need and desire and want and all these things, like it, it just, uh, yeah, it, it gets you into this binary state of thinking, right or wrong, right? Like what's the right way to do this? Like a lot of, uh, beginners in my program that I've been helping, you know, get their coaching business off the ground. A lot of their common questions are like, what's, what's the right way to handle this response? Somebody just said this on a sales call. What's the right way to handle that? Like. There's no right way to handle it, but this is this would be how I would handle it. You know what I mean? It's just a sign, like the right and wrong thinking is a sign of immaturity in the given arena that somebody's studying. You know, brilliant mathematicians, they don't see there being one way to arrive at the conclusion to a problem. That's ridiculous. That's only a byproduct of the modern education system. You know, brilliant mathematicians respect every way at arriving at the solution. There's no right or wrong way to do, you know, like math work on paper. As long as you reach the conclusion properly, then you've reached the conclusion. So I think those are the two main things that I've learned this year is like, there's no right or wrong, just reach the conclusion and just humble yourself, be humble, enjoy the process, be humble and, uh, you know, never stop putting in the work because, and not just stop putting in the work, never stop working on yourself. Because it's when you stop working on yourself that you've introduced the option of failure into, you know, the lifelines that you could tap into. And so, um, yeah, you guys, I don't know. I hope that this has been a valuable video for you. I think by sharing the lessons that I've learned at 23, I can maybe inspire some other people and add some value to their life and, and sharpen their perspective against mine and uh, make the things that you desire out of life in business come easier to you and with more clarity, certainty, and peace. And I hope that this video has helped you achieve that. And yeah, I mean, you know, I just wanted to share from the heart the things that I've learned. And uh, I just wrote this list kind of over the past hour or two as I'm reflecting. You know, it's 7.45. I'm just about to go into the mall. And now I've been to the mall. I'm officially going to be 24. And I'm very sentimental. You know, um, I like, you know, New Year's and birthdays and stuff like that and I'm very sentimental and I actually a lot of people are like oh you know people set new year's resolutions and it's a bad habit you know you shouldn't set new year's resolutions just start today 
and I'm like, I, I'm, I disagree. Like when I, I for me, a birthday is like, a, it's like a reset. It's like an opportunity to like take what you've learned and do, do more. You know what I mean? And uh, there's this like common trope in the self help space. Like if you're waiting until New Year's, then you don't actually want it. It's not that I was waiting until I turned 24. It's just that when I turned 24, I realized there's some stuff that I need to work on. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, I actually really think that like the turning of a new chapter is a very powerful thing if you let it be. So anyway, you guys, thanks for watching. If you watched this whole video, I genuinely appreciate your viewership, your loyalty, and that uh, I, I, I'm honored by the fact that people listen to me talk for this long. Uh, as few people as it may be, or as many people as it may be. I have no idea. You know, this channel, I'm just going to keep growing it. Keep stewarding the attention that you give me and making it worth your time. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.